Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. Today's webinar is Druid 0 0.6 Sweet 16 and Imply 3.1. I would also like to introduce today's speaker. It is Vadim Ogiebetsky, and Vadim is the co-founder and CPO at Imply, where he uses plywood with React to build open source UIs on top of Druid. Prior to Imply, he worked as a UI lead at Mar Metamarkets, which was acquired by Snapchat. Vadim has a master's in computer science from Stanford University. And with that said, I will turn the floor over to Vadim, and we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much for the introduction. And uh, hello, everybody. Um, it's great to have everybody here. Uh, I just want to uh, have this webinar to kind of like go through and look at all the new stuff that was introduced in the Imply 3.1 and also in Druid 016, which forms the basis of Imply 3.1. Uh, so this will be a very practical, very demo heavy um, uh, presentation. And uh, I'm going to start it in just a few minutes just, on, uh, just to see if uh, anyone else joins. Uh, so I'm just going to chill here for one more minute, and then we'll start. Just a quick comment, right. should anybody have any questions, please go ahead and open up the Q&A section of the webinar control panel. And this will allow us to capture all the questions for Vadim so that he can answer them when he's done with his presentation. Go ahead, Vadim. All right, so I'm gonna start. And um, uh, first of all, I'm gonna start by uh, looking at some of the new features of uh, Imply 3.1 that, that is being rolled out now. Um, I think uh, one of the uh, one of my favorite and most uh, kind of uh, nicest features I really like uh, when we do a lot of UI polish and just make the UIs really clean and smooth and easy to use. And right now, uh, with this uh, iteration, we re redid the polish of uh, the header bar and this kind of like pulled out all of the actions that you used to have onto the side here. So now it's very easy to search for whichever data cubes you want. Um, you just enter some string here and search for it. And also uh, you can easily add uh, new entities to this uh, plus button. We standardize this UI across uh, all components here. So um, you know, you, all of the relevant and most important parts are kind of pulled out here and also um, the, we kind of went through everything and just made lots and lots of UI improvements. For example, uh, when you're editing a data cube and you're looking at, for example, measures, uh, we completely improved the, uh, the look and feel of this dialogue right here and uh, pulled it out into separate tabs. So now we, it, it's a lot less cluttered and a lot more organized and there's a lot more options that can be surfaced to you because there's just more order here, uh, including changing how comparison is colored and configuring lots of advanced options. Um, I have, uh, so just lots and lots of UI polish all throughout. Now, uh, looking at, uh, Another very interesting feature is seeing how can people integrate uh, imply components uh, into, uh, into their workflows and their dashboards. And one of the things we, we did here is uh, 
you know, if you're looking at some view here at imply, for example, maybe you're looking at, I don't know, um, a table, uh, you can, if you enable it, you can go in and actually embed this visualization. It will give you a convenient link uh, with the stateful URL, an iframe uh, snippet that you can copy paste uh, and then just uh, plop it into your own HTML somewhere. And uh, when that iframe opens up, uh, it will be basically just that visualization with all the Chrome cleared out. Uh, so this allows you to really take these visualizations that you construct in Pivot, and uh, you know you can always put them together into uh, into a dashboard and kind of arrange them within Pivot into a cross-filterable dashboard that has been something that's available for some time. Uh, but you can now also arrange them into your own dashboard or uh, kind of bring them into your view. And we've greatly improved the capabilities of embedding pivot visualizations and views. Uh, so that was a big focus of this release from the pivot side. Um, and now I wanna just uh, shift gears and talk about something a little bit uh, different, which is uh, all the awesome improvements that were happening on the engine side on Druid. So the 3.1 release is based on Druid 0.16. Uh, so right here, I'm running the Druid that is uh, accessible from this cluster. And uh, we did a lot of work to make Druid easier to use and um, much more powerful in many ways. And I wanna go through these uh, right now. So first of all, right here, um, this is the, the data loader that comes with Druid. Uh, if you've been following our development uh, uh, relig religiously, if, you, if you've been to the last webinar, uh, this is not new to you because we added it in the previous release. But uh, if you maybe are just tuning in from, uh, and you haven't ha seen the last release webinar, then this is a completely new view you probably haven't seen before. I wanna just kind of, show it off here and uh, you know we added a lot of tiles and a particular one I want to call out is this re-index from Druid tile uh, which uh, you know previously you could ingest streaming data you could ingest batch data uh, from S3 or from uh, Google Cloud Storage but right now you can actually ingest data directly from Druid into back into Druid which means that if you have, um, if you want to drop columns, uh, modify columns, filter out data, uh, you can do this all in a point and click way. And uh, you can use all of the point and click uh, actions of the, of the data loader here to perform your kind of data cleanup actions. And uh, that's very handy, especially if you're uh, maybe doing a POC or trying out a new data source, uh, you can ingest it in some way and then try to kind of re-ingest it with maybe less columns or uh, fewer rows and see how, how that turns out. We also added this really convenient example data tile right here, uh, which just lets you load some examples and, and the list of examples here will grow. Uh, so you can just select one of the examples and it will point you to the file in the right place, and then you can start it and ingest it and, and have a really fun play around with it. Um, and the uh, last one, my favorite feature that, that's kind of added here is this notion of paste data. And that's really the ability to ingest data directly from the, the, the clipboard. Uh, and uh, if I, if I uh, if I open this up, I can basically type in some raw data here. I can just say name, uh, Vadim, uh, value. Uh, you know, the best data always comes from the heart. And uh, I can just, let's see. Uh, I, I can, uh, the, the, the use case for this is if you just want to try out how a schema will look like in Druid, uh, maybe somebody posts you on, 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 a, on a channel on, or 
on uh, email, somebody just posts a few events being like, hey, my events look like this, how do, you know, what do I do with them? Uh, you can easily just copy paste it in here, no need to upload it to a file and uh, kind of run through the, the Druid ingestion flow with, the, with this really small sample of data. It's very good for like prototyping queries and just experimenting with stuff. And there's a lot of uh, features that were added to make this kind of prototyping experimenting use case a lot nicer. So um, one of the things that I, I want to show next uh, is uh, I want to talk about the query functionality in Druid. But uh, to do that, I'm going to kind of go to the query view that is embedded here. And uh, we'll, we'll use that for a lot of really cool stuff. Uh, this release of Druid has seen uh, huge improvements in performance. There's several performance features, and they all combine together to, to give you a really big boost to, um, to how much oomph the, the database provides for you. So one of the uh, first ones I want to call out is uh, array-based group buys. Uh, it's a feature that is uh, with Druid 016 uh, enabled by default, kind of under the hood. Uh, you just, you, you just, if you're using Druid 016, it's there, it's enabled. And uh, that makes the group by engine more efficient by making it use more efficient internal, mem uh, internal data structures. With array-based group buys, uh, you can expect to see a 30% performance improvement to your group by speeds, and that's really at no, um, no cost whatsoever. Uh, so you basically upgrade to Druid 016 and see uh, better query performance. Maybe you will upgrade and see that you can actually uh, scale down your cluster a little bit uh, and run it a little bit cheaper uh, for the same query performance, or maybe you just benefit from the little boost. Uh, that's uh, a very exciting feature. Uh, and another very exciting feature that also works in conjunction with this to give you even more performance improvements is query vectorization. So query vectorization is something that uh, is on the Druid roadmap to roll out and be everywhere, like every query, every operation is vectorized. We're not quite there yet. We're doing it in stages. And in Druid 016, we've introduced the st stage one of query vectorization. Uh, what that means is that you can play around with it on your data. It's not enabled by default. And I will show you how to enable it and also uh, how to kind of run a meaningful test on your own data for uh, how much query vectorization will benefit uh, you in certain queries. Now, it should be noted that query vectorization currently will not support every single query type and every single uh, filtering construct. Uh, basically, if you make your query go outside of the bounds of what query vectorization allows, uh, it will not work. And then uh, you, will, uh, uh, you will not get the performance improvement from the vectorization. Uh, that's something that as we roll out query vectorization to be a fully top tier supported feature across everything, we will address. And right now, this is kind of in a more prototyping stage. If you want to read about the specific details of the limitations, look at the release notes, and uh, they're described here. But I'm going to look at a, uh, at a query right now just to, to give it an example. So I have uh, a top end query right here. And I have it running on a uh, data source, GitHub. And uh, basically, query vectorization is turned on through the context. Now, I'm going to run an experiment. So I'm going to set populate cache and use cache. Uh, I'm going to set these two things uh, so that, uh, to false so that I don't have, um, you know, I completely avoid the caching system in Druid. Uh, and that's something you always want to do if you're running a performance test. Uh, the cache will usually speed up your queries a lot by simply pulling them out from the cache. And uh, you don't want uh, to e either use the cache or have the cache repopulated uh, if you're just trying to benchmark the performance of a query. Um, next up, I'm going to set a custom query ID. So, uh, well, I'm going to set a custom query ID so I can track this query later. But before I do that, actually, I want to describe the vectorized flag. 
the vectorized flag is, uh, it has three values, uh, true, false, and force. So the default is false. Uh, and if I, if I mistype it, like I put an underscore in front of it, it's as if I don't have it here, it will be ignored. So this is basically gonna be vectorized false. So uh, right now I can make a query, I could say, uh, so I'll call it uh, um, uh, webinar, uh, no uh, vector, uh, and I'm gonna run this query. Um, and I get you know, a certain time back. I don't actually care about this the time of this particular query. I'm gonna run this query. I'm gonna do a very, very, very simple test right now. I'm gonna run this query uh, nine more times to get 10 in total. So uh, I get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. So that's 10 runs of a query with uh, no vectorization. Now I can, I can uh, put in this vectorized force flag. Vectorized force is a special option that basically says you must vectorize. And if you can't vectorize, then just fail the query. This is really to ensure that I'm, I'm definitely using vectorization and I haven't used anything in my query that would prevent it. Again, uh, this is really only helpful if you're doing a benchmark. Uh, in reality, you'd probably wanna set vectorize to true which will uh, basically say vectorize if you can, and if you can't, just still run the query, but don't vectorize. Uh, so I'm gonna do webinar with vector. I'm gonna run this query again with vectorize uh, set to force. So let's do uh, 10 runs. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. So I have uh, 10 runs of this query with uh, query vectorization enabled. And uh, because this is running in the implied platform, it's using uh, Clarity, which is our uh, APM for Joy that's emitting metrics from this cluster. And I can actually go in here right now. So this is a previous test that I ran. I'm gonna remove it and um, I can see uh, the queries for this cluster. And I'm gonna just make sure I'm completely updated to the latest data. And then I'm gonna pull in uh, my, uh, let's see, there's my webinar no vector. Let's update this again and pull in, uh, oh, there we go. I have my webinar right here. And uh, I'm gonna just select those two queries that I issued. So there's 20 queries and then uh, looking at it by ID, um, oh, that's strange, okay. So I think I messed this up somehow. So let's see. Um, uh, so let's look at it again. So I have uh, vectorize with vector uh, and I'm forcing this here. So let's, um, I'm gonna make a new query ID here. So, uh, just try, try this again. Okay, let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And uh, I'm gonna set this to false. And Set this to no vectorization, and then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and let's just grab that latest data. Hold on. OK. 
Come on. Oh man. Uh, this is the st standard presenter symbol trying to do a live demo always. Um, uh, never goes like how you want it to go. Right, let's try again. ID. Uh, and just wait for this to load. That's very strange. So I guess in the, for this particular query, I'm actually getting slower performance with vectorization, unless I'm messed up this test somehow, um, which is very weird. Um, so try it on your own data and, uh, and see, but uh, in the previous times, we've seen a huge improvement uh, up to 2x faster for certain queries. I wonder if this is not the right query engine to try this on. Um, the last, uh, 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 the last uh, thing I want to show off is uh, some nice improvements that we made to this query view for when you're testing queries out. Um, so um, let's see. Uh, so right here, basically, if you want to do a uh, you know, you want to show something off. Uh, maybe you want to uh, run a quick query. You can now uh, have these interactive actions where you can click on something and the query will autofill for you. Uh, what's more is that you can actually uh, change the order of actions and uh, kind of uh, interact with this query right from the console and actually understand how uh, how to query, like actually get the query to be rewritten for you. So I can change the sort order here to channel, change the sort order back, and um, uh, I can also add an aggregator directly from, from the, the site here. So I could say uh, count um, and um, add a, a sum count aggregator. Uh, or I could uh, add another grouping. Oh, I already have a channel. Uh, so remove this one and add a uh, group by the city name. Oh, and I guess uh, what's happening here is that uh, this query cannot be vectorized because I have the vectorized uh, set to force in my context. So I'm going to remove that. That is the uh, point of vectorized fall of force. Uh, so I must have done something that uh, the vectorization can't handle right now. And uh, run it again, and uh, the query comes back. This is a really nice way to prototype your queries. Uh, you know, you can easily apply filters. So um, uh, you know, filter on the latest month, and uh, it will rewrite the. Uh, it will rewrite the query for you. Uh, in this case, um, I could say, uh, let's say filter on uh, the latest hour, and I have the latest hour, and this query will automatically rerun for me. This is helpful if you're just trying to prototype your queries, understand what they do, and remember that whenever you have a SQL query in Druid SQL, you can always click here and uh, do um, explain SQL query and get a, um, a, a JSON of the SQL query right there presented for you. So uh, that is a really nice feature of Druid uh, 016 that is embedded inside the console. There's also a nice query history view. So if you kind of want to see which queries you ran over time, it's available here. So uh, there's a lot of other small improvements. Uh, this whole release was really about a uh, little polish here and there, and just making stuff uh, work uh, nice across every little uh, bit of the, uh, of the system. And uh, uh, I'm going to uh, wrap it up here, and I'm going to see if there's any questions. Hi, Vadim. Ready for your first question? Yes, please. 
Okay, and just a reminder, if you have a question for Vadim, go ahead and enter it in the Q&A section of the webinar control panel. All right, so the first question is, will you improve the on-premise version? When will we have official Druid Docker and probably official Helm chart for Cube? Oh, uh, great question. So uh, one, of the, uh, one, one of the really cool features of Druid 016 uh, is that in 016 and going forwards, there is a uh, official Docker image. Hooray. Uh, so uh, there, there is now an official Docker image that is uh, officially going to be maintained from uh, for like by the uh, Druid community and will be updated with every release. Uh, and uh, uh, this is something that uh, is now, now exists. And there's going to, uh, we're working to put out an official Helm chart to kind of go wrong, along with this. Uh, but uh, yes, uh, uh, there is now an official Docker image and that's very, very cool. It's part of the Druid 016 uh, uh, O release. Okay, great. The next question is, which formats does S3 support? Parquet, ORC, et cetera? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, if you're, uh, one of the big improvements that we did inside of Droid for, uh, for this release in 016 was actually making it uh, able to, uh, just generally extending the batch indexing system. And specifically, one of the things was, that was shipped in 016 was the ability to do uh, shuffle as part of parallel batch ingestion. Uh, now, uh, one of the things that we don't support yet is actually, uh, well, using the native batch uh, is reading non-binary files like Parquet or ORC. So right now, uh, if you want to use the uh, native batch ingestion from S3 or like any, any store like S3, HTTPS, anything, uh, the, there is a limitation that it has to be uh, a text file like CSV, TSV, JSON. It can be gzipped or, or, or zipped in some way, uh, but it has to be fundamentally a text-based format. Uh, right for the 016 release, if you want to ingest uh, batch uh, ORC or Parquet data, you have to use Hadoop-based ingestion, and you have to just submit a spec manually. Uh, the thing that we're actually hoping to do in the next release in 017 is make it, uh, make it possible to read uh, binary files as part of native batch ingestion, which basically would include ORC, ORC and Parquet um, and any other thing that Druid has a parser for. Um, and after that, uh, we also plan to make the native batch ingestion uh, be able to ingest uh, uh, and read directly from HDFS. When that is complete, we believe that the native ingestion in Druid will uh, be able to, in all ways uh, and, and shapes and sizes, replace uh, the need for Hadoop-based ingestion. And that would be a huge, uh, huge uh, win because a lot of people, uh, you know, it's a big hassle to have to set up a Hadoop cluster as well as a Druid cluster. So uh, we're very much looking forward to, to a future where you only have to do uh, a Hadoop-based cluster. But the exciting news is that if you have a text-based format, then in 016 today, you can do, uh, you should, you should be able to handle any uh, batch, like batch load in terms of size as Hadoop will. Uh, but, uh, uh, the ORC and Parquet, that is the o 017 territory. Okay, next question. Okay, so in Hive, this person says that they can create partitions like DataWise and recreate those partitions again when data gets updated. How exactly does everyone do this task in Imply, Airflow Operator, or something else available? Yeah, so um, there's several ways to update data inside of um, uh, uh, in, inside of Druid. Uh, 
basically one of one of the ways is you could um, essentially kind of republish partitions uh, or or what we call segments uh, as soon at some scheduled interval. So you could, for example, uh, have okay, like you ingested, let's say, um, a month of data, and then like some they got some new events, you could restate that day. Uh, and when you do that, you want to make sure to, uh, to pay attention to the segment granularity and tune that correctly because you don't want your segments to be too small, so, but you also, uh, so you know, when you do the uh, partition step, uh, you want to pay attention to this segment granularity. You want to make sure that it's not so small as to generate tiny, tiny segments, but also that it's, um, not too big that if you're republishing data, you, you're republishing a lot of it and too often. Another way to do this is actually to utilize Druid's uh, roll-up feature. Uh, the fact that uh, for, you know, for all intents and purposes, if you have uh, two events uh, that are the same in every dimension um, that you're ingesting, you could easily, uh, as far as anything, as far as Druid is concerned, they're going to just get collapsed into one. And uh, to do that, basically, you could do something that's called delta ingestion. Um, and there's more docs documenting that online. But the idea is that you would publish, and maybe you have an event, and it has like, uh, like maybe you have a transaction, right? And then uh, that transaction has a certain value. Uh, and then later on, you decide, you know what, that transaction needs to be amended or maybe that transaction needs to be canceled altogether. You can publish exactly the same transaction again with all the same dimensions uh, as the first one, but with the value negated uh, to uh, either like negated to cancel it out or, or just the delta to update the previous value. That will mean that all the aggregations in Druid that you would do all the queries will still perform exactly the same. Um, the uh, only thing that will put the only way you would even know that that event is there is by doing a, a raw, like a count of raw rows ingested into Druid. And then on top of that, you could, um, you could set up a, an auto compaction job like this. Uh, you could just set this up, uh, create an auto compaction spec, and that would cause Druid to automatically go and take this, take your data, take the, the delta data and then roll it up into, into single rows. Uh, so to, for this to work, you need roll up to be enabled, which uh, 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 is a great way to run Druid. And also uh, you need to do the auto compaction. And if you, if you actually think about it, uh, this uh, auto compaction step is actually kind of the same as what I said, the first thing I said, where you're publishing a new set of data yourself, because the auto compaction job will just take your data, take your deltas, and then it will compact it, except this is uh, much, you know, this will make, this will handle the resourcing and allocation for you and the scheduling. Uh, it will kind of do it in the background. Um, there's a background while when to, to republish this data. So the, those are the two big, uh, uh, big things that people do. Uh, and, and another one, just a, a really quick shout out that uh, is potentially, it's a, a separate use case in a way, uh, is if you have just like one column that changes uh, because of just things that get renamed or something like that, then uh, using a query time lookup uh, might be what you need, which is where you have a dimension and you have a lookup table and you can look it up. Uh, you can look up the values of this dimension in this lookup table at query time. And you can actually configure those from the console right here. There's a nice view uh, to, uh, to configure lookups. And uh, I have uh, some lookups already configured here. Um, and this is a very simple one with just an inline JSON spec, but the lookup can pull from anything, including another database. So this is another pattern. This is a bit of a different use case. The first two were kind of the same thing, just with uh, different allocation of responsibility. Okay, next question. Is there a plan possibility ability to use Elasticsearch as a source? 
Um, yeah, so the question of uh, using Elasticsearch as a source for Druid. Um, I think, uh, so practically speaking, uh, this is not something, something that's uh, coming in the very, very uh, near future. We're not currently working on that. Uh, we definitely welcome a contribution on, on that if somebody wants to do it, the, and uh, we would even put it in the console. Uh, but practically speaking, if you think about how uh, Elasticsearch works and how Druid works, the underlying operation that will be performed will be the same as if you just took, uh, took data from Elasticsearch, dumped it out into, an, uh, you know, into S3, for example, or uh, HDFS or, uh, or into just any kind of file system and then ingested that into Druid. Uh, there's nothing special about, uh, to my knowledge, about Elasticsearch uh, in terms of connecting to it in some particularly special way, like, like, you know, like Druid does with these streaming sources, like Kafka and Kinesis. Uh, you know, there, there's a lot of special knowledge involved with, uh, you know, offsets and uh, keeping track of how the ingestion's going. I think an integration with Elasticsearch, uh, would, if, if it was here as a tile in this console, it would just be something that would save you one step from, uh, a, like under the hood, it will just dump all the data out and then like kind of load it in. Or maybe it will like uh, kind of pipe all the data directly into Druid, but that will just save you uh, maybe like the, the space on, on S3. And that's a very small saving. Um, while, uh, you know, doing this uh, kind of like the simple way of just, all right, well, like use whatever, you know, whatever system you're trying to migrate into Druid, the easiest thing to do is always use whatever capabilities that system has to just dump that data out as, as TSV, for example, and then um, ingest that uh, as you wish. And that gives you full control over how that data will be dumped out from, from that system in terms of selecting the columns and the performing any transformations before you, you extract it. So uh, the, I guess the short answer to that is uh, no, but um, uh, a contribution welcome, but also uh, I think a good workaround for that is just to go via S3 or, uh, or HDFS or what have you. Okay, does Druid 016 support query from remote file systems without pulling an index to the local FS. Yeah, so uh, the the question is uh, basically is, is it possible to uh, query uh, data directly on uh, like uh, S3 or something like that? Uh, the answer is no. Uh, all data that's queryable in Droid is data that's indexed, converted into segments, and managed as segments. So basically, it has to be in one of these uh, one of these things um, for it to be uh, queryable inside of Droid. Uh, and you can pull in data from uh, from remote file systems or from S3, but uh, the data basically has to live here. I think it's something that uh, in the future. Uh, uh, we will, uh, it was something that would make sense to make possible. Uh, it would actually even be really cool if that was its own tier. So uh, in Druid, you can specify different tiers of servers. So you could essentially have, for example, the hot tier uh, that serves the, maybe the recent data, the recent month, because that's what your users are querying most often and most aggressively. And you also have a cold tier for maybe like the last year of data. Uh, after the month and then like nothing afterwards. And uh, what would be uh, really cool is if you could then have like a, like a tier that actually goes out and reach it, like the, the super cold tier that like uh, the archival tier that actually can go in and just talk directly to deep storage or directly to uh, the, the file system and it will be very slow, uh, but it will be able to serve all queries. That's something we're, we're thinking about and talking about building. But right now, in Druid 016, uh, the answer is that all data that is queryable has to be indexed into a segment. And you can index data into a segment 
through this data loader right here. Okay, ready for the next question? Yes, please. Okay, so will all these nice consoles and full pivot versions be available in the on-premise setup? Yes, absolutely. So everything that I'm demonstrating here, in fact, the uh, what I'm showing off right now is uh, like this entire cluster that I've been demoing off uh, is an on-premise cluster. Uh, we have, uh, I mean, it's on, it's it's the on-premise version of our software running in our own on-premise. I'm I'm using air quotes uh, environment that happens to be in Amazon. Um, we also have our Amazon cloud environment that, uh, that actually, uh, are, that kind of is a managed service and like the joy to spun up for you there. But, uh, everything that I'm showing off here is available uh, in on-premise. And this is something that, uh, is kind of like a hard commitment from us, uh, to the community. We, we want to make sure that. Uh, you know, even when you run Imply Cloud, it, it's a managed service, but uh, like you own the, the servers and the data, you, it, like it's, it's operating in your VPC. So we want to make sure that like, you always have like all of these, all of this functionality uh, and in the um, on-premise version. Uh, and uh, you are welcome to, uh, if you want to experiment with the pivot and the, this console, uh, you're welcome to try out, uh, go to our uh, imply.io um, site and um, on the get started page, uh, you can fill this out and this you will get exact this you get exactly what I'm running right here. And also this console, uh, everything that is that ha like, all of these screens that have this like Druid logo on them, uh, there this is actually part of Druid itself. Uh, so this is uh, available even in uh, open source uh, Druid. This is something we're contributing to the community and trying to make uh, Druid as nice and easy to use as possible. Um, you know, this demo right here is actually running from a uh, uh, an imply version of Druid. So uh, that's why there's this IAP uh, tag on it. And uh, that is just a uh this is our release of druid that's just a little bit further ahead than the community one it has a few nice uh, uh bug fixes and and nice things like that but everything that goes into this release uh is something that will go into uh the next release of joy the only reason we have it is so we can make releases uh much more frequently than the druid release cadence which is quarterly Okay, will the Druid console ever be multi-user? For example, that a user only has access to one data source. Uh, so uh, in Druid, you can set up uh, user permissions. Uh, you have to read the docs on how to do it. You could set up a basic, um, like uh, basic auth and uh, kind of configure it that way. And uh, the console uh, is actually served as a completely static file from Druid. It's just, it's pure like um, HTML and JavaScript and CSS. And it then uses uh, the APIs of the, the public APIs of Druid to, to build all of these views, which means that whatever, uh, whatever permissions you configure within Druid, the console has to obey by them. Kind of, it has absolutely no choice not to. Um, uh, that said, uh, the uh, the way that the you know the enjoyed in general is a very uh, kind of power uh, power level feature. Like the access to this console is something that's really meant to be for uh, the admins of Druid, the the people who are trusted with loading new data into your cluster with um, maybe deleting a data source and, and setting retention policies. So uh, this is not something that should really be 
kind of exposed to users. Uh, and kind of in Druid, the way you think about it is that you have uh, like the admin permission or, or no admin permission. And, and the console definitely requires the admin permission to work. Uh, so there are no plans right now to make the console as kind of a, um, a standalone uh, like query UI that would be like kind of given to, to users on a user by user basis and the kind of like, oh, you create this one data source. This is very much uh, a power, power user tool for your Druid admin. And uh, I would think that kind of all of them would have uh, the same level of, of access to it. Um, and yeah, so uh, it should also be said that uh, the, if you are accessing, if you're deploying the imply framework, access to the console can actually be gated through the standard implied permissioning system. Uh, so you can basically say like these people can, uh, you know, as part of the implied user roles, you and you say, okay, this person can edit dashboards, this person can administer dashboards, this person can like create dashboards, this person can like do this, do that. Uh, one of the options is actually to be able to provide or deny access to the console. Okay, next question. What about custom math for indexes and or visuals? Um, so uh, I guess the question is about uh, doing uh, custom um, aggregations or, or custom like transformations for, uh, you know, for showing your visualizations. Uh, that is something that we support kind of like the, uh, this is something that depending on exactly what kind of custom stuff you want to do uh, is available on many different levels. So for example, uh, inside of uh, Pivot, if you, are, uh, if you have a measure, uh, you can actually, uh, you, you have these like expressions, uh, plywood expressions that you can enter and they can express some pretty uh, complex custom mathematics. Uh, that is kind of expressible within the Druid context. Uh, if you have, if you're thinking of going, this is at query time, obviously. If you're thinking of going beyond that, uh, then you can actually, uh, you can actually define custom transformations, which uh, from Pivot will call onto totally custom code that you can have in Druid. One of the powerful features of Druid is that you can very easily extend it. And in extending Druid, you uh, can create, you know, uh, you can create an extension, like an extension to any component of Druid. But one of the most, most commonly extended things is actually the ability to define user-defined functions, uh, new constructs, special sauce, uh, and that kind of embodies some maybe uh, some custom aggregation that you run to rank your data or to do some kind of ordering. Uh, and that is something that uh, is very common. Uh, you would plug it in uh, as you'd create it as an extension and then you'd uh, showcase it. Uh, you can see that, um, uh, you can see which extensions are loaded and kind of understand more about that. And then from, from doing that, you can also uh, then call out to, to that from Pivot and also make it available in SQL. That is uh, at query time. And then at ingest time, uh, if you're ingesting some data, uh, so let's say I'm gonna start with this example here. Um, there is this transformation step right here. And in this transformation step, you can apply a custom transformation to your data. So I could click on this column, edit, create a column called edit plus one. Uh, for simplicity, I'm gonna add the edit plus one column. It will actually preview that for me. So, so this is uh, in just time transformations and custom math that you can do either on a row by row basis like this to create a new column or you can do it as part of the schema uh, to configure like a measure in a very particular way. Um, so uh, both, both are po possible. Uh, so, the, so the answer is yes, there's lots of places to put uh, custom math. 
And uh, all of these places can be utilized from Pivot. Okay, next question. Do you plan to have a Kubernetes operator for Apache Druid? Yes. Uh, so, uh, oh, you know, we hear about Kubernetes uh, a lot. And one of the very exciting things that we uh, uh, are rolling out uh, right now, and this is kind of in the beta program, and if you're interested, please contact us. Uh, I, I mentioned before that we have a cloud-based version of, um, of our software, of our stack, uh, that, uh, that kind of has the cloud-based manager to it. It lets you spin up a cluster with just one click, which is very cool. Um, we're also making an on-premise manager for Druid that can basically, you know, whatever, whatever on-premise means to you, whether it means in your own cloud, not peered to us in any way, in your own uh, Amazon cloud, in your own Google cloud, in your own Microsoft cloud, uh, in your own uh, data center, uh, in your own like uh, internal cloud, uh, you can deploy this and it will manage uh, all of uh, Druid for you. Now that, that system is completely based on top of Kubernetes. So uh, it completely utilizes and leverages Kubernetes to, uh, to perform these actions. And that is uh, something that uh, we're working on very aggressively now. Uh, we'll be contributing a lot of the, you know, the uh, Docker, Helm, like all of the kind of the packaging work that goes around it into the community. And uh, it's something that we'll be supporting as a top tier product. Right now it's in beta and we have uh, uh, a few customers that are trying it out and seeing how, how it suits their needs and giving early feedback on the system. Okay, we have time for a few more questions. So the next one is, does Druid support Avro when fetching data from Kafka? Yes, um, it does. Uh, so uh, there's an extension that you need to load. Uh, it's, uh, just type in Druid, Avro, Kafka, uh, nice lazy Google right here. Uh, and uh, so there's the uh, Druid Avro extension and uh, you would need to use the Avro stream parser uh, and uh, it will uh, it will fetch your data for you. Okay, great. So um, this person's asking if you can release some performance test results for larger than 1 billion docs data set. Uh, so yeah, I think there are some performance benchmarks that uh, uh, we release. There's a, there's actually a benchmark from a university benchmarking us against um, uh, a uh, uh, against Presto for very large workloads. Uh, I know our uh, some of the people in the community have shared some uh, informal performance things, uh, but uh, there's it's always good to have more. Uh, you know, performance-oriented docs and more validation around it. So uh, we will look into uh, that and, and uh, see what can release. And we'll, it's, we'll definitely be releasing that as part of our kind of like scheduled uh, uh, programming, so to speak. Okay, great. Um, what is your vision? What is the vision for machine learning use cases? Yeah. So um, I think oh, one place where we see Druid uh, be really utilized within machine learning use cases is uh, when you're actually running a uh, machine learning system in production, uh, at, at the highest level, the, the system can feel like a, a bit of a black box. Uh, sometimes, uh, you, know, it, you know, if it's a neural network or, or, or something based on that, then uh, you really have no direct visibility into how it makes its decisions. And Druid is really the perfect solution for instrumenting uh, any kind of ML-based system. So uh, we see a, a lot of people, uh, you know, at a high level, uh, the place where you want to use Druid is if you have some system that is uh, 
you, you, you don't have transparency into it because it's complicated. And you want that transparency and you want the transparency uh, to be something real time that you can interact with uh, on the fly. Then Druid is the, this, the system which, which you wanna set up and you wanna collect uh, metrics from your black box and, um, and put it into Druid. Now that block, black box could be people clicking on your site. It could be your ad server uh, at serving ads to certain people and deciding on uh, who to, uh, you know, which bids, uh, or it could be an auction house. So you could be deciding uh, who uh, was bidding on what. Um, and uh, it could also be something that, um, it could also be something that is a machine learning system. So that's a very common use case for it, uh, especially around uh, looking at uh, machine learning around fraud detection. You know, if you are a financial institution and you're doing automatic fraud detection, you wanna make sure that uh, your, uh, whatever ML system you use to, to do that is actually performing in a good way and doesn't have a, a false positive rate or a high false negative rate. Uh, and Druid is the, is the, the, the thing that you wanna kind of use to really see okay, how did my system perform? Why did it perform badly here? What's the root cause? Really dig into it. Okay, um, I think we have time for one more question. So let's do one more. Yeah. What query should we use if we want to find distinct values from 1 billion data sets in chunks? Is there any UI for firing query and playing with it? Um, so uh, if you want to find the distinct values of a, uh, a, a very large data set, uh, then uh, that's the, I mean, you can use any query and you use the, um, the uh, uh, count distinct aggregator. So if I go here and I look at like Wikipedia, I could actually go and uh, let's say, uh, if I wanted to see how many distinct pages I have, I'll just click on it, I'll add aggregate count distinct. Um, and, and I'll not have a number of pages. Now it's actually, I'm gonna remove these group bys here, just get a, a high level count distinct. Uh, let's run that. Uh, oh, oh I, yeah, of course, channel isn't being grouped. I don't need it. Uh, so in the past hour, I have this many distinct pages. Obviously, uh, this is a lot shorter than a billion. Uh, let's actually change the time to, um, you know, be the, the last uh, month of data. Uh, I'll get a lot more information this way. So I have a lot more distinct pages that are edited on Wikipedia in the last month. And uh, fundamentally, this will scale to real-time queries over whatever kind of uh, data size that you have. One of Druid's core strengths is the fact that it has all of these awesome approximate algorithms built into it. And um, it's, uh, it's, very, it's very nice. Uh, they're very, very powerful. Now, this is a uh, approximate query. So the reason it can be so fast is because it uses probabilistic data structures that with a bounded error rate uh, can give you a certain, uh, uh, they, they give you the result really, really quickly, which is perfect for uh, user-driven exploration. Now, if you wanted to uh, do, have an exact count here, uh, you can do that also. You can actually just do that by, um, by setting a context flag. And from the console, you can just check, use a prox count distinct, it's checked here. I'm gonna uncheck it. And it's actually gonna add this line into my context when I uncheck it. And if I run this, um, it will uh, take a, a longer, a lot longer. Uh, in this case, it's a very small data set, so it doesn't take that long, but uh, it, it will do this calculation and it will do it in an exact way. Uh, so this is the, absolutely the query you should use. Um, absolutely use SQL for that because it will be able to, uh, this is a real, really an example of how like SQL is, uh, is great because it will be able to optimize itself into the correct thing under the hood. And if you're wondering 
well, like I still want to know what, what exactly is it doing under the hood? Uh, well, you can do uh, the explain query plan and see for yourself. That's the query that you should use for approximate count distinct. And Druid has actually several different uh, approximate data structures. You know, our, uh, the original one that we shipped with was hyperloglog. Log, uh, and uh, one of the newer ones is Theta sketches. And again, they're all the same from SQL, like SQL kind of abstracts over those for you. Uh, but you can also, if you are interested in which exact algorithm Druid is picking under the hood, uh, given your high level, Oh, wait, hold on. I just did a count pages. I want to do a count this thing here. Uh, this thing. Um, yeah, okay, so this will, it will take longer. I was like wondering why that was so quick. Uh, oh, yeah, so I'm, it's because I'm doing a, a non approximate one. And this cluster isn't provisioned with enough resources to do it. So I'm going to do one that is approximate. Uh, and there you go. So, okay, pretend I did that all along. Um, and it will, um, uh, so, so yeah, but again, same answer still stands. If you want to understand what is this actually doing under the hood, uh, you, can, you can explain the query plan and understand what's going on. All right. Well, that takes us a little bit over the top of the hour. And Vadim, thank you so much for a great webinar. Audience, thank you so much for your participation. There were a lot of questions today. And if we didn't get to all of your questions, what I'm going to do is copy them and send a copy to Vadim. Um, and from, uh, you know, he hopefully will be able to answer some of them in a follow up blog post at some point in the future. All right. So thank you again, Vadim. And again, thank audience. You. Thank you, and we hope to see you on a future show. Take care, everybody. Take care, everybody.